The Go-Getter, a story that tells you how to be one. Once upon a time in a land far away, well, it was the early 1900s in San Francisco actually, there was a large and successful company, owned by a crusty old gent who went by the name of Cappy Ricks. Cappy Ricks's company started in lumber and expanded into overseas shipping, which is why they had a branch office in Shanghai. And Cappy Ricks was not happy with the way things were going in that office. In fact, the fellow managing the Shanghai office had recently absconded with a large sum of money and was now nowhere to be found. Which is why Cappy was looking to hire a go-getter to straighten things out over there. But this time, he'd have to be sure he was sending the right man. And though he didn't know it yet, that man was Mr. William E. Peck. In walks Bill Peck. Excuse me, sir. Uh, I, I'm Bill Peck, I just want you to know I'm just so thrilled to meet you and looking forward to being on your team. Rick says, do I know you? Not yet, sir, but I know when you get to know me, you really like me and together we're going to do great things. He goes, Rick says, you're here about the job, aren't you? He goes, yes, sir. He goes, but listen, you need to put an application in with human resources They're down on the first floor. He goes, I saw those people on Monday, sir. Rick says, and? They told me no. Okay, well, why don't you see Jennings? He's a, a super, he, I saw Mr. Jennings on Wednesday. What'd Jennings say? He told me no. Then Rick says, why are you here with me now, Mr. Peck? He goes, because they're both wrong, sir. I know if I got to know you and meet you, you'd see the goodness in me, and together we could do great things. He goes, I see. Well, listen, I'd love to stay and talk with you, Mr. Peck, it is. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I've got to, to get on the train. It's leaving at 6 p.m. I'm going to Santa Barbara tonight. But would you do me a favor? I might need your help. Peck says, yes, sir, anything you want, I'll do it, sir. It shall be done. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, my niece was here visiting with me a few months ago, and we were just down shopping, and I think it was on Geary Street between Powell and Stockton. She fell in love with a little object in an art shop, Cohen's Art Shop, C-O-H-E-N, Cohen's Art Shop. It was a little blue vase about this big. She just loved it. She said that she had one that matched it and it would be a perfect match, that she could put them on the mantle. But I didn't buy it for her, Mr. Peck. I wish I had. It can't cost much. So would you go down there and get that vase and bring it to me at the train station uh, by 5.55? The train leaves at 6. But I really would like to take that too hard. I just don't have the time. If you could do that for me, Mr. Peck, I'd be much appreciated. It shall be done, sir. Peck leaves in joy. He says, I can get this done. I got three hours, no problem. Jumps in the cab, rides down, gets off at the corner of Stockton and Geary, and he says, let's see, um, it is 335, and he said it was between here and Powell. So he starts walking Geary, and there's no Cohen's art shop. He walks back maybe south. Maybe he went the other way. No Cohen's art shop. It's 405. Maybe he meant down Stockton. That's what he did. He went down one block on Stockton and branched out block each way, north and south. Then the other way, north and south. Then he went up Geary, left and right. He was spreading his search pattern out larger and larger. And finally, at 10 to 5, he found it. <laughs> Cohen's art shop, C-O-H-E-N. There's the blue vase sitting right where Cappy Rick said it would be, and great, I'll just go in there and get it. And the door's locked. No, 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 no. It should be open. Little handwritten sign hanging inside the glass said, Closed early, family emergency, open Monday at 9. This can't be. He says, I, I've got just a little over an hour. Cohen, okay. Can't be that many Cohens in uh, San Francisco. So he jumps in a cab and he goes back and he stops at a pharmacy. Sometimes they have a phone in there and they did. So he, he cashed in a $5 bill and got all nickels and he gets the phone book open. There are 27 Cohens, C-O-H-E-N. And he starts calling. No answer. No, he doesn't answer. No, he doesn't have this. He doesn't have an art shop. He's not home. No, 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 no. Can't believe it. It's 27. There's no... <sighs> 
maybe, maybe there's a number inside the art shop, you know, for emergency contacts or something like that. Maybe that's what it is. It is 515. Jumps in the cab, drives back on, pays the cab, he gets out, and he walks up to the uh, shop. It's still dark, but he looks at the sign, Cohen, K-O-H-N, Cohen's Art Shop. It's the same store. There's the blue vase, the sign. How can I make such a mistake? It's spelled totally different. I've been calling the wrong people. He jumps back in the cab, goes back to the pharmacy, goes to the telephone. Still got nickels. Phone book, nine, K-O-H-N. He starts calling him at number eight. Yeah, Mr. Cohen, he owns art shop down on Gary. Well, listen, uh, I need to talk to Mr. Cohen right now. Uh, I'm sorry, he's not here. Well, you got to tell me where he is. I got to get a hold of him. I can't give out that kind of information. Listen, I work for Cappy Ricks, Ricks Logging and Timbering Company. You work for Mr. Ricks? Yes, I do. It's a matter of life and death. I get a hold of your boss. Well, he's at the judge's house for dinner in Sausalito. I guess I could give you the number, but this better be on the up and up or we're all in a lot of trouble. It is, man, please. Number, thank you so much. Calls the number. Yes, I'm Bill Peck. I need to speak with Mr. Cohen immediately. Matter of life and death. Uh, just a minute, please. Shuffling, clock ticking. Cohen. Yes, sir, Mr. Cohen, you don't know me. My name's Bill Peck. I work for Cappy Ricks. There's an item in your store downtown. I need to buy it and get it to Mr. Ricks. He's leaving on a train. It's a matter of urgency. Can you open the store and do that? <laughs> I'm sorry. My uh, manager down there, Pendergrass, had a death in the family. I gave him the day off. Let him close early. But you can't wait till... No, sir, no, sir. It's got to be done today. Okay. For Cappy. Yes. I'll give you Pendergrass's number, call him at his house, and tell him I said it's okay to go down and open the store. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. He calls Pendergrass. Hello, Mr. Pendergrass. He's not here. Where is he? Well, they had a death in the family. He went for a walk. Mr. Pendergrass went for a walk. How long is he going to be gone? Maybe five minutes, maybe five hours. Okay. Peck hangs up the phone. Okay. What can I do now? Maybe, maybe, maybe the neighbors on either side have a key that can let him in. Maybe. He gets in the car and he starts in, in, in the cab and he gets on the way and he looks in the floorboard of the cab and there's a ball peen hammer. I'm not a vicious, evil man, not a lawbreaker. I got to get that. <laughs> he picks up the hammer, puts it behind him, pays the cabbie, steps around the corner, and of all things, there's a policeman standing right in front of the door. Hadn't been there anywhere all day, and here he is in front of that door with a nightstick in his hand. Can't believe this. Okay, let's take another shot at Pendergrass. Gets in the cab, goes back, calls Pendergrass. He just walked in. You saw it here. Here he is. Mr. Pendergrass, you don't know me. My name's Bill Peck. Work for Cappy Ricks. Your boss, Mr. Cohen, said to open up the door. Sell me blue vase now. Got to do it quickly. Pendergrass says, okay, I'll be there as quick as I can. Said, Hurry, please. Matter of life and death. Keep your shirt on. So... Peck standing there, one leg to the other, waiting, waiting, waiting. It is 6.42 when the cab rolls up. 6.42, cab rolls up, Pendergrass gets out. Hurry, this guy, really he's just frantic. Pendergrass says, keep your shirt on. Opens up the door, says, okay, yeah, nice piece, okay, this, let me turn the lights on, okay. Guy says, Peck says, how much is it? Got a $100 bill thinking it's just minor, that's what Rick said, minor cost. Uh, it's $2,000. Peck says, I got a hundred dollar bill. It's two thousand dollars. Do you want this or not? Can I write you a check? Let me think. Friday at uh, six. No! Okay. You're an art shop. Do you know diamonds? Quality diamonds? Of course. He goes, take a look at this. Tell me if that's worth two thousand dollars. Pendergrass says, oh, yeah, nice ring. That's worth at least $2,500. Good. I'm going to write you a check for $2,000. You hold the ring as collateral. If the check doesn't clear next week, you keep the ring. If it clears, I'm going to come back and get my ring. Good? We're good. Wraps it up in newspaper. He tears out of the office. It is 7.05. He gets to the train station. It's cold and dark and quiet because the train's gone. Okay, I got it. I got. It. I just got to catch a train. I got to get. And as fate would have it, next to the train depot, there was one of those little 
airplane crop dusting things. There was one of those newfangled airplanes with the two wings in the open places for people to sit and he starts running towards it. There's a house next to the plane. He thinks it must be the owner. Probably I've seen him spraying crop. That's what he does. He, doors, it's dark. It's night. He's knocking on the door. Guy must get up early. He was asleep. He wakes up, flicks on the light, looks out, opens the door with his shotgun and says, what do you want? He goes, sir, I've got to rent your airplane. You've got to fly me on down. We've got to catch a train that's going to Santa Barbara. He goes, what are you, crazy? Get off my front porch. He says, i got a $100 bill for you. He says, get in the back seat of that airplane. $100, that's money. They take off. Now understand there are no lights on the runway. There's no runway. It's a field. He takes off just by the light of the moon. And they're flying south, watching the moon glint off the rail. That's the only lead they've got. They're trying to follow that rail, thinking they'd catch the train. And the plane's going as fast as it can, but it's not much faster than the train. And all of a sudden, they see little plumes of smoke from over the hill. There it is. There it is. Faster, faster. They see it come into sight, and there's the train as they fly by all the little windows and people. Yes, fly up ahead of the train a quarter mile land and let me get over on that track. He says, are you crazy? He says, just do it. Pilot lands, trying to dodge cows and trees, stops short of the tree line. Peck gives him his $100 bill, jumps out and starts running with his little newspaper-wrapped article under his arm. He can see the train light coming. Down in the ditch, tears his pants on the barbed wire, cuts a flip, gets up on the train track. He looks bad. He is right in the middle of the train track. Now, the engineer sees an obstruction, so he gives the whistle on the train, and it's not moving. What is, that's a man out there, and he's waving his arms. Is he crazy? He's no, he's going to get killed if he, all of a sudden he's not moving. Engineer hits both brakes. I mean, the wheels all lock up. These things stop. Sparks are flying like the 4th of July, and a shriek pierces that calm night, and the train slows, slows to a stop. Eight feet in front of Bill Peck, just huffing and chuffing and Engineer is so shaken, he gets down and says, Oh, you crazy? It's a federal offense. You're going to jail for a long time. Guy says, I'm sorry I had to do that. i got to get on that train. It's a matter of life and death. I need to talk to Mr. Ricks, Cappy Ricks. He goes, Mr. Ricks is in the seventh car. He goes, I'll be, i got to go see him right now. He goes, good luck, buddy, because if it's not, you're going to jail. He hustles back, excuse me, Cappy Ricks. Yes, matter of life and death. They finally usher him toward the back of the seventh car. As he approaches one of the assistants says, Mr. Ricks, we have a gentleman here to see you. Ricks was reading his newspaper. He lowers it and folds it and sets it aside. Now, Peck is dripping and torn and bloodied and wet and dirty. And he walks up with this little soggy eye and says, Sir, I'm so sorry I missed the train. There were some things that came up. I, I, I took care of all that stuff. But I knew you wanted to give this to your niece. and It was very important to you. I wanted to make sure that happened. So... I hope she enjoys her, her little uh, vase uh, very much. Ricks takes it and puts it down, doesn't open it, doesn't look at it. Says, you got it, didn't you? Guy says, sir? He goes, you got the blue vase. He goes, isn't that what you wanted? He goes, that's exactly what I wanted, Mr. Peck. See, I gave you the wrong directions to the art shop in the first place. He goes, you did what? He goes, yeah, I changed the name on it twice. <laughs> Had a policeman stand out front when I thought you'd be tempted to break the glass. Made the judge, made the, the owner over to judges. I knew that might give you a problem. I made sure that it, had, it cost more than you had in your pocket. And I made sure that if you did get it, you wouldn't get to the train station until after it was gone. By this time, Peck's thinking, I'm going to kill this old man here in front of all these people and probably go to jail anyway. He says, why would you do that to me, sir? I, I just wanted to complete the task you assigned me, and yet you made fun of me and made me do these ridiculous things. Why would you do such a thing? Rick says, you missed the point, Mr. Peck. I need a manager for our Shanghai operation. That person's going to have language problems, supply problems, transportation problems, legal problems, communication problems. He's going to have all kinds of things going wrong. If you can't handle them, I can't be there to hold your hand. We're in trouble. I need somebody, once they know what the job is, they get it done. I sent 15 people after the blue vase, Mr. Peck. You're the only one that brought it to me. You want a job? Bill Peck says, yes, I'm your man. 
See, that's the whole point of our first award. After you become an agent, the first award you can win is the blue vase. Within the qualifying period, the criteria is in front of you. The goal is set. We know that there's going to be all kinds of other issues. Take your time. You're going to be marketing other, pro other products. You're going to be hiring people. You're going to be office. You're going to have a lot of things going on. You may be tempted to lose sight of right and life insurance, but it's essential that you do that in order to succeed. We know if we put our first award focusing on life insurance and you make it a goal and you stick to that until it's accomplished, then your chances of succeeding as an agent have been greatly improved. The blue vase, overcoming obstacles, you can do it. Adapted from The Go-Getter by Peter B. Kine. Written and presented by Steve Ladd.